I just got back from a vacation in Michigan to visit my parents and my family. And uh, I got to tell you, the the most odd thing happened to me. We uh, had offered to go up to Myers, which is like a grocery store. They used to call it Myers Thrifty Acres. And I still insist on calling it Myers Thrifty Acres. Uh, We're up in the Myers and uh, we're doing a little bit of grocery shopping for my mom and dad. And, and because we had the whole crew coming over. So like that, ah, we'll go and get food. Don't worry about it. So we're up there. We're getting food. And uh, I'm, I'm walking through the store with my younger son, Max. And I'm just talk. I just said like a couple sentences to him walking through the produce section. Like, where do you think the carrots are or something like that? <laughs> and, and I walk past and I and, and all of a sudden this voice says, Brad Geiger. And I look and uh I had been recognized by nothing more than my voice. It was the mother of one of my best friends in high school. I stood up in his wedding. Uh, it, it was his mother. I haven't seen her for over 20 years. No she way. She recognized me by my voice. By your voice. I mean, to be fair, you have a wonderfully rich, and I love, I love the sound of your voice. <laughs> Uh, but 20 years, good on this woman, first of all, for remembering yeah. your voice for 20 years. And then also good on your voice for being memorable for 20 years. <laughs> it was really interesting. Uh, and we sat there and had a, a wonderful conversation. We caught up for a little while. In fact, uh, you know, I am notoriously kind of a curmudgeon, uh, antisocial. She actually had to do the shake hands and push the shoulder convention thing <laughs> with me. She was like, well... It's been really great to see you again. And and she shook my hand and pushed my shoulder like I do to booth barnacles. So I knew <laughs> that I had been oversharing. But I guess I, it was so amazing to, to run into this woman. And it was so nice catching up with, uh, you know, how's, how's Mike doing? How's his kids doing? All this kind of stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, I actually got treated like a booth barnacle in the produce section of Myers. I wonder if you and I are alike in the sense that I am the kind of uh, semi introvert that when I actually do get going, my wife, after a couple of minutes, has to like at a party, has to be like, all right, slow it down there, Kojak. Yeah. Uh, you, I, don't, yeah. I don't know what you're going on here, but uh, you're just talking to human beings. Slow it down. You get too yeah. excited. You get it going. Yeah, because it's like it's 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 the Pinocchio thing. All of a sudden, I'm a real little boy. You know, it, it, it's not, I'm not an automaton. It's like, oh my god, this this is what regular people do all the time. They talk and they visit, and then, and all of a sudden, there's a hand on your shoulder, and you're getting pushed towards the celery. So uh, Brad was in, in in vacation in Michigan last week. I, if, for those yeah. wondering about the quality of my microphone this week, I am currently in Wyoming, of all places, on vacation. Wow. Uh, going to Yellowstone tomorrow, um, mm. uh, but uh, so it, Brad's on the good mics. I'm on the travel mics, as they say in the podcast business. I'm doing the NPR yeah. technique of recording in a closet with the pillows and the, the towels around. Um, yeah. But but that's where we both are this week. But it was a good trip home, Brad, to Sh- Mich- Michigan. Well, that was fun. Oh, it was great. It, it really was nice. I mean, we had a very nice visit. We were up there for about a week. Uh, And we had excellent travel weather and traffic uh, for all of the legs on the way home. We kind of split the 13 hour trip up into two legs. We visit my brother-in-law and his wife and their kids uh, while we're in in Cleveland. It's the perfect halfway point. And it really was kind of uh, a charmed uh, trip. We didn't have any problems at all. It was it was kind of great. Well, let me ask you this. I've never asked you this before. You and I have both willingly chosen to become city boys in the sense that yeah. you you pick Philadelphia, I pick Los Angeles. We put down roots. We built decades of life now in those cities. We're now city boys, right? We know how to navigate right. a city. For oh, example, I, I walking around. Uh, I'm in Jackson Hole, uh, Wyoming at the moment, <laughs> and it's 90 percent trucks and a lot of gun racks on the truck. It's just like, was yeah. a very different life. It's just not what yeah. I'm used to. But so going back home to Michigan now, in let's say the second half of your life. Can you see yourself ever retiring to Michigan ever? It happens every time I visit there. Uh, I, I, it, it usually uh, takes me about 20 minutes, but for about 20 minutes, I'll drive past one of those old farmhouses with a, with a smallish barn in the back. And I immediately get the fantasy of moving back up, uh, you know, having, having this place that's out away from everything 
putting my studio into the barn in the back and building that out as a, as a freestanding studio. And I, it takes me usually 20 minutes to go, oh my God, I, I would survive so short here. I, I, I wouldn't make it a day. Let's face it. I would not make it a day. Uh, and, and it usually takes me about 20 minutes to realize that. <laughs> I think this time it might have taken closer to 10. It was like, <laughs> oh no, I've, I've been here before. You ain't, you, this ain't going to happen. That's funny. I, 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 I have also had that, that, um, that uh, desire for a barn, though. There's that one cartoonist. Yeah. I'm trying to remember her name. She's the one that did the famous birthday card, Hippo Birdie, to you. Did you oh, oh what's Sa- Sarah Boynton. Boynton, Sarah Boynton. Boynton, who's yes. delightful, by the way. I sat next to her at an NCS dinner one time. She, if everyone wants to Google it, uh, Sandra Boynton did a, a beautiful barn, and she converted it into a studio, and it's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, and I, I, there's a part of me that, like, that seems lovely. And then you yeah. realize, yeah, but then you're also living in a super small town and like there's no resources. There's I, I don't know. I go back and forth about small towns, but yeah. I love the barn aspect of Sandra Boynton having a gigantic barn studio, like a corner where for painting, a corner for sculpting, a corner for woodworking, a corner for cartooning. Yes. That sounds yeah. magical to me, you know, in my older years. Yeah, a bunch of boxes of books up in the hayloft. I've got it all kind of scoped out, but and and I keep telling you know when I'm in that 20 minute zone, uh, I, I always say to my wife, "Think of the money we would save because the cost of living turns to be yeah, a little bit less expensive in rural areas than in urban areas." And I think of the money we would save, and she said, "Think of the money you're going to have to spend on a divorce lawyer." Because <laughs> as much as it would not be a good fit. For for me, it would not be a good fit for her. Yeah, she, well, she grew up in the big city, right? And she grew up in Canton, which was middle, middle, kind of metropolitan, but uh, not big, not little, but uh, right, big right. enough that, big enough that, uh, especially if there's a lot of the attitudes, particularly towards gender roles and so forth, oh, that God, would, yeah. just would not be a good fit. No. Um, but uh, <laughs> it is fun to imagine you in your barn, uh, yeah. also also surrounded as you are right now, surrounded by boxes of books and yeah, unpacked exactly. items. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other. That's probably why it took so long or it took so short a time to knock me out of my uh, rural fantasy because it involves moving. And right now, the space where I am in right now, I'm never moving again. Once yeah. I once I get this place figured out, uh, I'm never touching another uh, box or a dolly you're gonna have to uh, drag me out of here feet first (laughs) well and on that note of dragging brad anywhere i'm gonna say hello everybody (laughs) welcome to comic lab the show about making comics and making a living from comics i'm brad geiger the editor of webcomics.com and the cartoonist of evil inc and i'm his pal dave kelly cartoonist of drive and sheldon and co-director of the documentary stripped and this week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave, let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. We've got a big show for everybody and uh, a lot of um, a lot of updates, frankly, mid show. Uh, there's a lot going on, frankly, between social media and distributed fundraising on, on oh, both the yeah. Patreon and Kickstarter front that we're going to talk about on this week's show. But Brad, you had mentioned something when we were talking about Michigan before that I wanted to jump back into. And it was about shopping in Michigan. Yeah, well, while I was at the Meyer Thrifty Acres and while I was being recognized for my voice, uh, I also, you know, we, we spent time walking all over. It was one, it's like a Walmart day. You know, it's, it's, it's a grocery and they also sell clothes and they also show, uh, sell home items. It's what, it like, uh, almost like a Target, right? So they also have books and they had book stands uh, set up at different places, uh, magazine racks, different places along kind of point of sale things too near the uh, near the checkout counters uh, to entice you to pick up a magazine here or a book there. And I'm I got it and it it really struck me, especially being in Bad Axe, Michigan. I saw at least at least eight or nine, maybe ten different books and magazines that were anime or manga themed. 
And I'm telling you right now, I don't remember seeing a single book or magazine with a Batman or a Spider-Man or any of the American comics characters on it. But I do remember seeing My Hero Academia, Dragon Ball Z, uh, 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 Demon Slayer, <laughs> uh, just uh, so much anime and manga. And and it really it, it really struck me as to how much that has become uh, not only a, a part of our uh, American pop culture, but a real dominant far- form of comics culture. Yeah, I mean, that that super resonates with me because uh, at least in my chunks of L.A., there are two, maybe three, let's say two Barnes and Nobles, one of which is one of the biggest Barnes and Nobles in the world, the one over at um, the Grove in Los Angeles. Anyway, yeah. uh, Barnes and Nobles for our overseas listener is, is the big sort of um, chain bookstore left in the U.S. They all sort of had a trouble in the late 90s, early 2000s. Barnes and Noble was the big winner. Um, and so they're sort of the standard bearer of what a quote unquote bookstore is in the U.S. Anyway, I was at the uh, the largest uh, Barnes and Noble in Los Angeles, and there are four, maybe five times as many rows for manga as there are for American produced um, graphic novels and comic books, broadly speaking. Yeah. Right. Um, and now I know that that obviously won't include floppies. So, but right. you have to ask yourself, what is a kid most likely to walk into a comic book shop or a Barnes Noble, a more like a Barnes right. Noble or a bookstore or a Myers, in which case the graphic novel, the hardcover, the soft cover are having to compete against manga. And they're in my yeah. mind, there is unquestionably no uh, 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 argument to the fact that, Manga won. Manga absolutely yes. won. Four and yeah. five times the shelf space is winning. That they've won over the hearts and minds of future readers. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And and here's the thing that's really amazing, especially if you're if you've been doing comics for a while, like Dave and I have. When we first came into comics in the early 2000s, uh, early web comics, there was an early divide between anime and manga style comics and people like Dave and I, which were more uh, we grew up more in the vein of newspaper comic strips. Mm -hmm. And there was a real dislike between us right there there was a there was a real animosity there and uh and i gotta tell you uh just going into this entire theme of of what we're talking about uh i i avoided manga for an awful long time and anime and it kind of took my kids uh dragging me into it saying no nah, you're gonna like this you, you just gotta give it a chance and you're gonna like this uh not only did i like it but i gotta tell you dave I think just looking back over my work, I think I creatively leveled up when I started paying attention to what was happening in manga and anime. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you have to ask yourself as a cartoonist what manga did that American slash Canadian comics didn't do. Yeah. And so much of it was it allowed for individual, unique new stories in a way that American comics just forgot how to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. What yeah. America got really good at doing in terms of producing uh, comic strips, comic books, was, hey, the audience that we already have captured, i.e. 40-year-old white guys, let's just keep selling to them. And, yeah. and they never tried to get anybody else. New stories, new voices, new angles, new approaches. And so we got the same Batman, Iron Man stories again and again and mm. again and again. Like, oh, in this one, the Joker is slightly more evil. Oh, in this yeah. one, the Joker is slightly more friendly. Like, it's still a Batman story. You know what I mean? Right. Whereas you look at Attack on Titan, that is so out of the box. You look at like yeah. um, uh, the, the um, gosh, I'm trying to think. The, the, uh, the, uh, there's so many that I can't even think of one. There's a million types of sports stories, romance stories, cookbook stories, uh, office stories in manga that American comics after the purge in the 50s, 60s, just forgot how to do. They just forgot how to do it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And 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 what I, I mean, for me, I, of course, the thing that opened my eyes and smacked me in the face uh, was My Hero Academia. Uh, in that, it was unhinged creativity, not only in the art, but is certainly in the writing. Uh, they've they've got a they've got a character, Dave. I don't know how much you follow it. It's called the best genesist. J E A N, Jeansist. Uh, he's a character who has a le- le- uh, or denim, 
literally up to his eyes. He's got like uh, what you would consider the waist of a pair of jeans around the upper bridge of his nose and a belt that goes all the way up. His outfit is ridiculous. Okay, but it's 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 amazing. It is unhinged creativity. It's it's absolutely not uh, uh, penned in by anything. There's one character who shoots tape as in like scotch uh, adhesive tape out of his elbows, not out of his wrist, not out of his eye, you know, mouth or any uh, out of his elbows. Right. It's unhinged creativity. And I sat there watching it saying, oh, my God, I, I I've been not necessarily holding back, but I ha- it's more of a situation where I, I haven't allowed myself to even consider going that much off the ranch. Right. It right. was like, geez, you need to. And then 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 I started seeing some stories also that that really had some excellent narrative structure to it, had some amazing uh, drama aspects to it. Even if it was a, a comedy, it had some it, it, they made me care. They made me passionate about the characters. And it was like it was a wake up call to me. It's like, you know what? In a lot of ways, you've been going through the motions, kind of mimicking that Marvel and yes, DC yes, style. Of, of, That's exactly yes. it. Yeah. And and holy cats, here's a group of people that have not been mimicking it. They let their they let their creativity go loose and they did amazing stuff while still sticking and and nailing some amazing uh, narrative uh, technique. And it was it was like an eye opener. It's like, hey, you better you better get on the stick, Geiger. This is who you're really competing with, or, or this is the level that you've got to measure up to if you're going to win audience in today's uh, uh, marketplace of readers. It, 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 you're not going to be able to just kind of go off of, hey, here's here's a trope that we all know from Spider Man. How about this for a storyline? You know, uh, it, 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 you, you, I, I had to really kind of reassess where I was creatively. I really appreciate that you said unhinged creativity because yeah. that to me is, uh, I hadn't thought about it that way. And it's really a symbolic way of looking at what we're seeing with manga versus yeah. with American comics, which is American comics had sort of self created a box to put itself in. Mm-hmm. In that, I, let's, I know I keep going back to superheroes, but a superhero always had to be a rugged individualist. Whereas yeah. if and that was the one box that they always had to be in. It was like, well, if no one else can do it. Then I Wolverine will fix this problem or I right. Batman or I, you know, and only when American comics sometimes cheekily made fun of itself, did they allow for a Deadpool or a Great Lakes Avengers or right. uh, like somebody like a cipher on the X-Men that the powers were useless, you know, that kind of thing. And whereas all of my hero academia is saying, like, listen, these are just humans that some of whom got great powers, some of whom got really stupid and useless powers. If you read through my yeah. hero academia uh, mm-hmm. and that's the way mutancy would work, which is great. It's, it's just it's it's unhinged and it's more fun and there's whimsy to it and joy to it and kind of Marvel and DC forgot to have whimsy. And they walked away from the rugged individualist thing, too. If you read My Hero Academia or a a lot of manga and anime, it's about the group. It's not about me doing it. It's it's the importance of the group. It's the and and there's no we've said this before. There's no training montage in a manga. Uh, It's about the training. The journey is the story. It's not we don't fast forward through that part. We spend a lot of time in MHA with our main character, being not very much in control of his powers, right? And we don't fast forward through in a training montage. That's the first several years of of that anime, uh, the first several books. Uh, it's all about the journey. And and I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I am saying uh, it, that is that for all of us, there's not a single one of us who's not uh, affected by this. It's easy to be trapped in preconceived notions. And it's really important to expose yourself to some different storytelling because it'll smack you right across the face that there's other ways to do it. And it's why I, by the way, I, I recommend uh, a lot of reading. I, I, I've had the same experience with romance novels, right? Yeah. Because all of a sudden, the stuff that I'm, that I'm reading is like, oh my gosh, these are fantastic concepts. Uh, it, it's such a great way to look at uh, uh, storytelling. The more you expose yourself to this stuff, uh, uh, the more you're going to be challenged as a creator. 
Well, and I just wanted to go going back on rugged individualism versus helping yeah. out the group. Just so we're not focusing on superhero comics with manga, like even yeah. Way of the House Husband or Spy Cat for the Spy Family, it's spy all about family. the rugged individual realizing that there's power and value in joy in helping out the group. You know, on both of those. Yeah. But anyway, the, I don't want to focus in on that too much. But I, I do want to say though, and this is the learning lesson, like Brad was saying, for all of us, is the takeaway is I think moving away from mimicry and moving into recognizing that we have value in telling our individual idiosyncratic stories that really speak to your heart is actually yeah. something we've learned again and again in webcomics that will find you the strongest audience in the sense that um, the story that you sometimes think, oh, well, no one will like this. It's just for me. I'm writing this yeah. for me. It yeah. turns out that there's thousands of people that are like you that are looking for a romance in space or a cookbook that's also a Western. You're like, whatever weird story you want to tell, there's an audience yeah. for that because we've all had a hundred years of storytelling in comics that went down a very specific path and frankly got trite. It got boring, it got mimetic. It's like, there mm -hmm. was nothing new there. You're like, how, how often can you tell a new Tony Stark is, is alcoholic, but he's fighting against it. He's created the story. Like, who cares at this point? Yeah. You know, there's nothing new under the sun there. That's what I've said so many times. People are like, wouldn't you like to write a Batman comic? And I'm like, oh, God, no. What? There's There's been decades of Batman comics coming out on a nigh-weekly basis. What am I possibly going to do with Batman that hasn't already been done? Right, you know, right, I, it, right. it's, it's like I'd rather go out and find a new uh, place uh, to go out and forge some storytelling uh, this this is road that's been traveled over so much that there's there I I don't know I, and and listen I, there are people that are that are pulling rabbits out of hats uh, uh, finding something new and that's a challenge in and of itself and I I commend that but it's not for me yeah and, and Brad I'm so glad you mentioned romance novels too because one thing again with the purge in the 50s and 60s you yeah. know uh, American comics forgot about romance and how right. central that could be for comics. And romance comics on webtoons are by far the one of the biggest volumes of both production and fan driven excitement. So yeah. it's just amazing that comics forgot that on on in America for 50 years, that romance comics could be huge. To the point that literally, I think if you're if you're not doing a romance comic and you're posting it on webtoons, I kind of think that in a lot of cases, you're probably wasting your time. Yeah. You know, if yeah. and 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 you get extra deductions if it's not drawn in an anime style or right. a manga style. Uh, if you're if you're if you're doing a, a, a newspaper style comic strip and it's not romance and you're posting on webtoons and you're confused as to why you're not getting traction, you just got to just just go to webtoons, the main site and look, look, look with your eyes. Yeah. They yeah. don't want that. They don't want that at all. So, Brad, I would actually like to give you the platform to wrap up a bow on this with the idea yeah. that manga has four and five times as much shelf space as uh, American comic books, graphic novels in American comic book stores. Yeah. Um, the popularity on Webtoons is huge for for stories that are never seen in American comics. What is the bow that you would wrap up for a, a young up and coming cartoonist that's looking for advice on what this means for the future? Well, what this means is that for, for a young person, I think, is that you, so I think the mistake would be to say, well, I'd better start doing a romance anime. Style, yeah, that's sure. Manga, right? yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Because and by the way, that's kind of what we all did. It's a natural assumption. We all did newspaper comics because when we were growing up, that was the mark of standard of quality and making a career. Right. So it's it's understandable that it, that you your takeaway could be, well, I better start learning to like romance writing and I better start drawing like I see in manga. Uh, the real takeaway for me is that the real good stuff out there is when you let your creativity off the hook, you don't have any preconceived notions, you take in like a sponge as many different things, particularly things that you wouldn't normally watch. I was listening to our old episode last week uh, while we were driving up to Michigan. Actually, we had Comic Lab on and we were talking about like, like experimental dance and different types of uh, uh of of entertainment that we we don't like 
And I'm saying kind of maybe try to veer towards some of those things that you wouldn't normally like and go outside of your comfort zone and get challenged creatively uh, and, and, and to take in all of that stuff and to let your let your creativity go. And uh, that's the real takeaway here is yeah. that that being stagnant, taking preconceived notions, doing it like uh, your heroes did it because you think that's the only way to do it. Isn't that it's, it's a good place to start and it's where we all start. But at a certain point, you got to let your creativity go. And, and that's what happened. That's the reason that the manga aisle is five times bigger. They, they, they weren't hemmed in by uh, everything that American comics culture uh, got hemmed in by, including the comics code. Yeah. Uh, let your creativity go. That's where the good stuff is. That's the, yeah, that's the perfect bow to tie up on that one. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Well, Brad, we got a couple updates to talk over with everybody this week. Um, uh, first one is going to be about Threads, which, as we all yeah. remember, had this meteoric rise in terms of signups because they made yeah. it so easy for Instagram users to kind of sort of one click and you're over on Threads and, and Bob's your uncle, you're set. Yeah. Uh, but it seems to be that in the weeks following that launch, the users are there, but they ain't using. It's not, yeah. it's not, uh, it doesn't seem to have a sort of sticking power emotionally yet. And I'll be honest, even with me, if I have one thing that I'm <laughs> going to share on social media, Threads is not yet the one that I go to to be like to share the one stupid, you know, the sort of offhanded thought that you want to share. Right. It's not comics. Um, and you're not going to copy paste it to all five of them. Threads right. hasn't won out on the one that I pick. I still tend to pick Twitter uh, right. just by force of habit. Um, but, Brad, I wanted to get your thoughts on this about Threads semi dropping like a stone in terms of usability. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 been really interesting to watch because, again, uh, our our uh, advice in the previous show was that, listen, you need to you need to get on threads. You need to start posting on threads. And I, I still think that's the case. I think it's still too big to ignore. But I I, I am not. Uh, disagreeing with you in that uh, the engagement has been uh, lackluster from my standpoint. Uh, the, the, the experience has been not so great. Uh, it, it really has been underwhelming. Uh, and th but then you take a look at the landscape. You've got really the, the big players here are uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Blue Sky, Threads, you still have to count Mastodon in there, even though, as I've said before, I don't think Mastodon's going to be it, but you can't count it out either. I'm still posting on Mastodon just in case I'm wrong, but uh, I, those are the big players and none of them are really delivering what we're hoping for. In fact, I, I, even though... Uh, I, I, I'm very disappointed with it. I still probably get my best engagement on Twitter just because I've, I've got the biggest number of followers there. But as I'm watching all this happen, Dave, I had a thought and I wanted to bounce it off of you. Uh, so so as Threads comes out and it is the air apparent in the first yeah. week. Everybody yeah. is gobsmacked. Everybody is like, oh, my gosh, this is it. Here's the Twitter killer. And two weeks later, it's like, ah, I'm not feeling it. This this uh, the, the engagement drops, all of this other stuff. My question to you, Dave Kellett, is this. Is this not so much a problem with threads, but a problem with social media in general? Are we as a people over social media? I mean, 
I'll be honest, I just don't get the excitement on threads that I do. And so maybe what I'm feeling in that specific moment is an overall ennui about social media in general. Mm-hmm. Is that and but also maybe we're older and we just don't care. I mean, uh, younger folks might have a completely different and very passionate attitudes towards their burgeoning social media uh, experiences. I don't know. I yeah. I'm I, I do share with you some days a very burnt out feeling about social media that I'm just like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know about any of this. I don't know if I care anymore. Uh, yeah. I mean, like you, I, I I also just to reinforce what Brad's saying, I still get tremendous feedback and engagement from Twitter, both in terms right. of clickouts, likes, uh, retweets, all that sort of stuff. Threads is kind of up and coming. I will be honest that for me, from my vantage point, Blue Sky still has passionate creators, but it doesn't seem to have any sort of readers or users on the other end. So nothing gets engagement right. because it's it's kind of like a room full of artists talking to other artists so far. Yes. You know? Um Mastodon, I never dipped a toe in, so I can't speak to that one. Brad would have to. The truth is, I don't know what's going to win, and I don't know if anybody has any passion, passion, passion for any of them at the moment, you know? What if there's no winners? In other words, oh, like, God, in yes. other words, what if this is the end of so? Listen, social media had a beginning, it had a middle, and it's going to have an end. What yeah. if this is the end of social media? What if we're just over it? Uh, we're as as a group of people, we're over the whole thing. We're over the experience of of social media. We're over every all the positive and the negative that comes along with posting on social media. What if we're over it? What then? I mean, what then is uh, the version of the advice that we've had for for two decades? But in terms of owning and controlling your own website, printing and owning yes. and controlling your own books. Uh, mm-hmm. maintaining and only controlling your own distributed fundraising by a Patreon and Kickstarter. The trick is it gets a little bit harder to bring in new people because yeah. the way you have to bring them in is word of mouth, essentially, yeah. you know, whether that's they're sharing the clicks on their, in their life, they're telling friends in, in real world uh, to check it out. Um, it just, it makes it a little hard. Social media did have an advantage for us with cartoon mm-hmm. as cartoonists in terms of getting it to people that never would have heard of Brad Geiger. And oh, right. lo and behold, their old college buddy has retweeted you, and now they're seeing Brad Geiger's art in their feed for the first time ever. And they're like, hey, this really sparks me. I'm going to check it out. I don't know what replaces that if social media fades, which is kind of feel, like right now it feels like what's happening when, remember when the whole generation of people decided to fade away on Facebook? Like, I yeah. mean, yeah, it still exists. Yeah. I still have an account, but <laughs> it's not what it was for me five years previous. You know, like we right. all had that period with Facebook. I feel like that might be what we're kind of seeing with micro blogging uh, social mm-hmm. media, i.e. Twitter, threads, Mastodon, Blue Sky, in some respects, Instagram. I, I don't I don't know. I, the truth is, I don't have the solution or the answer or see where this is going for us. Yeah, I I. I, I... In the beginning of the year, uh, I remember having a lot of these topics that fell under the everything old is new again. Right. And in fact, I remember around January me saying that uh, some of the solutions that we have on the horizon are going to look like some of the old solutions like and don't laugh web rings. Right. Remember right. in the early 2000s, sure. we had sure. web rings. It was a way that if I got a reader, I could hand them off to you and then you'd hand them off to the next person. I think I, and I and I am serious about this. A, a, a lot of my thinking over the past couple of weeks has been that the uh, the, the fade out on on threads in general that we've all seen after that big bombastic hit. And now the it's all the tide is going out. Uh, it's got me back to thinking about what if this is the end of social media, then we're going to have to take a bunch of our old tricks out of the suitcase, <laughs> dust them off, give them a new coat of paint and start going back to those old ways of doing things uh, with 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 an updated uh, touch or using new technology and so forth. We're going to have to reimagine some of those old solutions uh, because we're we're right now, 
the internet publishing landscape is very much headed towards a post social media future. And I don't know whether it's going to go there, but that's right now where I see it heading. And I think folks like you and me that started in, in uh, internet publishing in the two thousands, we're going to have to take a, a new look at some old ideas. Yeah, but I'm I'm increasingly feeling, and I don't like this, that this is going this way. I'm increasingly feeling that discoverability will largely be platform-based for cartoonists. And by that, mm. I mean, uh, if, if and I don't want to do it, and I'm, first of all, I'm not recommending this path, and I don't necessarily right. want to do it for anybody, and I don't recommend anyone do it. But if you're young and want to be discovered with a comic, Webtoons is a possibility. If you're young and want to be discovered with a comic and you want to make money from it, a Patreon's follower feed that's increasingly going public and increasingly becoming like a social media feed that might mm-hmm. win. But what I'm getting at with both of those is the the place where you're publishing, i.e. Webtoons, i.e. Patreon, is also where your socially media type uh, being discovered. Boy, that that Kim fell apart sentence wise. But I, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is the platform is also the discoverability point, which is different yeah. than social media, which is where you're publishing on the comic and you're syndicating it into social media. Mm-hmm. I increasingly feel like the next version of where this might go would be that younger people are discovered on the platform that they're publishing on. And yeah. I don't like that and I don't recommend yeah. that. And I'm not endorsing that. I'm just saying I could see that becoming the new norm. Yep. Let me ask you this. If Project Wonderful came back today, would you install it? Project Wonderful was the ad based system. Yeah. Uh, I I always liked Project Wonderful. I was kind of sad that Ryan uh, decided for all good reasons uh, to end it. Um, No, I don't think I would. I I like for what I this problem is right now, though, Brad, I'm an established, quote unquote, cartoonist. I found an audience. I can keep going where how I'm going, publishing on my site distributing it on social media syndication wise, um, and then making money on distributed platforms like uh, Patreon on a recurring basis and Kickstarter for big projects. That works fine for me. I'm just saying for a 21 year old, 23 year old who is launching a new comic, that seems increasingly tricky without social media. If in fact, these next couple of years, these five or six platforms are all of middling success where none of them are great, you know, like, yeah, Twitter, by the way, we're not calling it X because that is a stupid no. name and we're not going down that path of, ugh. it's like when, it's like when someone picks their own nickname, Brad, like Brad, yeah. I want you to call me Scoot Duder from now on. Yeah. And Brad's like, to hell with you. I'm not calling you Scoot Duder, yeah. you know? <laughs> I, I think we all had one of those phases in fifth grade where we try, you, you, you give it a good shot. You know, you try yeah. to come up with a very impressive nickname. Hey, everybody call me killer. Yeah, oh yeah, you know, that's that's what everybody from my other school calls me. You can just call me killer. And they're like, Yeah, you you haven't killed anything but a but a chocolate milkshake recently. You know, you're you're not killer. Yeah, you can't do it. Uh, and 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 the amount of money that Elon Musk has wait it has thrown down the toilet in terms of branding. I saw some experts, some marketing experts, uh, uh numbering it in the billions of dollars of uh, of 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 market share that he's lost in branding alone. Let's face it, the, a tweet was a tweet. W- it was a vernacular. You, you didn't call it a post, even if you were on Facebook. You were liable to call yeah. it a tweet or a retweet. Yeah. They they had Kleenex level of marketing uh, mind share, and they flushed it down the toilet. It's it's really amazing to watch. You know what also pisses me off, just because we're both visual thinkers, is the amount of websites that have the bird as the icon of like, here's where you can find us on Twitter. I have it on my sites. You have it on your sites. If this son of a bitch keeps going down this X path, eventually we'll have to rebrand. And I kind of refuse to do it. I'm like, no, I'm keeping the bird on there. This this is stupid beyond stupid branding. If you notice, no one is doing it. No one expects it to last. There's no, not very many uh, major sites that have taken the bird down yet because I don't think we're expecting it to last. We're, yeah. we're, it's, lit, it's literally, why change this? I'm gonna be changing it again in another six months. I just yeah. leave the bird up, you know? Uh, but you mentioned Kickstarter and that brings us to our next update topic. Yes. Recently on Twitter, uh, Kickstarter reaffirmed its commitment to AI, uh, particularly when it comes to art and writing. In other words, the question was, are you going to disallow a project on Kickstarter if it uses AI technology? 
And they said in no uncertain terms that they were not going to do that, which means that you can uh, uh, potentially, ostensibly, you can expect a uh, an AI book, uh, a book containing AI art, a book containing AI writing. You can expect to see those on Kickstarter with regularity. Question yeah. I have for you, Dave Kellett. Does this change whether you're going to use Kickstarter in your next campaign? I will be honest, and this maybe sounds cynical. Uh, it will not change me one iota in terms of my attitude towards Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, I know, and I love that people are up in arms about the very existence of AI art or AI generative yeah. art or people that are using AI generative art. And I respect that. I love that. I, those people are needed. I, what I... My attitude is a little more cynical and beaten down in the sense that there's already terrible things that I personally dislike on Kickstarter that are funding and making tons of money, making way more money than I'll ever make. And I hate them. I disagree with their outlook. I don't like the way they were made. I don't like the philosophy behind them. You can all probably imagine based on how you know me through the podcast of what mm -hmm. those things might be. Right. Um, but frankly, it doesn't matter because you probably have different ones that are also existing on Kickstarter that you hate and you personally would disagree with. Yeah. The thing is, as a platform, uh, it encompasses more than I, Dave Kellett, wish it encompassed in terms of what kind of things it um, includes on its site. Mm -hmm. And if AI is added to the mix, again, maybe I'm just a little too beaten down by the world, but it doesn't change my personal equation. How about you, Brad? What do you feel like? Does, it, does the presence and welcoming of AI onto the platform change your attitude for Kickstarter? It did. It did. For, oh, for it did? It did. It did. For about as long as, as my farmhouse fantasy uh, uh, took, I literally <laughs> sat there and I'm, I'm just telling you the truth. I sat there talking to my son saying, you know what? This has me really reconsidering backer kit, which by the way, I use for post Kickstarter uh, fulfillment because I think backer kit is fantastic. We've talked about him, endorsed him on the show. I, I love backer kit and I use it when I, uh, if I if I successfully fund a Kickstarter, that's my next thing is to convert that right over to BackerKit. Well, BackerKit has a uh, basically a Kickstarter competitor now. Basically, you can do your entire campaign on BackerKit, so it would it would save me from having to switch everything over to BackerKit on the back end. And uh, th th there's only two drawbacks that I could see or actually only one drawback that I could see as I'm talking my way through this as a thought experiment. I, I'm talking to my kid and I'm like, you know, the only thing is, is that uh, uh, more people have established Kickstarter accounts than have established backer kit accounts. And so now I've got to I've got to convince that person to create a backer kit account if they want to participate in my campaign. But I think that it, it's significant, not as significant as it used to be, you know, in yeah. my experience, 10 years ago, getting somebody to sign up for a site, but there was a lot of uh, worry surrounding that and a lot of, a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. But uh, today we've, at this point, most of us have signed up for so many different accounts on so many different sites. Uh, it, it's kind of like a law of diminishing returns as far as that resistance goes. It's like, okay, I, I'm going to sign up for my, you know, 150th account. Great. I guess I'll do it because I want this thing. It'll, I, it'll just take a couple of minutes and everything else. The thing that got me, the thing that popped me out of my fantasy is this. It is so easy to reach out to former Kickstarter backers when you launch a Kickstarter and you yeah. get such a yeah. big return yeah. out of doing that. I, they, they, they get notified in the first swing anyway. Uh, they're more li or I should say they're more likely to hear about it in the first swing. Uh, and then, and I know you do this uh, and as well as I do as that Kickstarter goes on, you go out to the people who were Kickstarter backers of Sheldon Volume 1 and you say, hey, since you were a big fan of Sheldon Volume 1, I wanted to make sure that you didn't miss your opportunity to get Sheldon Volume 15. And then a few days later, it's you're doing the same thing with Sheldon Volume 2, just like I do with Evil Inc., yep. Sheldon yep. Volume 3. Yep. And you're going through. And by the way, the reason you're doing that is because everything you do, you get a huge new, you're positively reinforced for doing it. You get a huge new influx of new pledges. And I 
don't I, I've spent so many years on Kickstarter doing that. I don't want to give that up. And when I realized that, I realized I'll probably launch my next campaign on Kickstarter. Yeah. And I can hear not without reason listeners yeah. going, Brad and Dave, you, you're not putting up enough of a fight on this AI front is that this yeah. is dangerous. If you don't yep. put up a front fighting this, then you won't be able to make money on uh, Evil Inc. Volume 28 and Sheldon right. Volume 17 or whatever, you know, whatever we're on at that down the road, because AI is going to have stolen all of your existing stuff and and incorporated into their style. People will be able to create new stuff based on your work, all that sort of. And I, I do get that. I understand that. But a part of this is I have 10, 15 years of people consistently stealing my stuff online the nine gags, the thread list, the, the T-shirt companies, the this or that, where they mm -hmm. literally take my five best jokes and put it on a million products. Uh, and I can send a and d and get them to take it down and stop it. But as Brad always says, um, and, and, I, and I think what I'm, what I'm saying through that is that in part I've been beaten down, is that I yeah. know that I'm, I'm not going to stop everyone who wants to try to steal something from me. It's just the nature of the internet. There's always somebody in some shady part of the internet that figures out that that joke really works and I can put it on a t-shirt and I can put it on yep. a hat and I can put it on this. Um, but as Brad always says, uh, they can steal the past stuff of you, but they can't steal future you, future work that you're doing. What's tomorrow's yeah. Dave Kellett comic going to be? What's tomorrow's Brad Geyer comic going to be? Yeah. And so I have found comfort and solace in the fact that my, what you can steal all of my pre-existing drives. Okay. They're all, you've stolen them all. But you yeah. don't know what the, tomorrow's update is going to be. I, only I know that one, you know. Right. And so I know that is a, a sad solace to find. Is that like, well, you've really been beaten down if that's the only thing you can find solace in. What I'm getting right. at, though, is that you're not stopping AI. It's not going anywhere. It's going to be incorporated all over the place. Um, I, I hope and expect that the WGA and the SAG negotiations are going to be able to limit AI's influence in writing and in acting. I hope because it, that will be a death knell on their business. But for what we do, which is independently created art that we own and control, I don't know that. And again, maybe this is me just being beaten down and cynical. I don't know that it's going to impact my art all that much. And right. I'm also too small of a person individually to impact how it will influence the rest of art big art art with yeah. a capital a quotes around it right i i can't impact how ai is going to change that but i can i can react for my own career and my own independently owned and operated uh publishing career mm -hmm. i don't know that it's going to impact me am i being naive to that brad am i not seeing something with kickstarter having ai that that sheldon and drive could be ruined by that no, I, I, I think it's a pragmatic uh, view at the end of the day. I, I think I think I because I kind of agree with everything you're saying. It's like, yes, I could leave in a huff. It's not going to change. You know, they're not the, the Kickstarter CEO is not going to get a, a phone call saying Brad Geiger has lowered the boom. He's leaving Kickstarter, you know, and oh, everything is ashes and whoa. Uh, and, and yes, I do understand if enough of us do it, then then it's going to change. But I, I I don't see that happening. I, and, and by the way, if enough of us do it, AI uh, art and writing, AI technology is still out there. It's still there. It isn't going away. This is just kind of uh, uh, whistling past the graveyard. Uh, th this is coming for us all. We're going to all have to uh, figure out how to deal with this. And uh, it, 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 making a decision on Kickstarter isn't going to change that. In fact, uh, knowing uh, uh, that this is you know, this landscape is the way it is. It's even kind of more important for me to be uh, to make this next Kickstarter as successful as it can be, because right. there might be, an, you know, another crowdfunding uh, swing coming up where I, I it, it's it's maybe isn't that easy or I've got a, a different set of. Uh, obstacles I've got to hurdle. So it, it's it's even more important to kind of make hay while the sun shines. Right, right. And it's funny because I, when AI first started coming onto the scene and, and I was really thinking it through for the first six months, I got yeah. kind of despondent about like, well, 
it's going to get better and better every six months. It's going to get more and more amazing, right? There's going to be exponential growth curves in terms of what it's able to do. Yeah. And I, I don't know why, but lately I've been swinging back the other way that I'm not actually that afraid of AI anymore. Mm-hmm. And I don't, maybe it's just because I've gotten used to what it currently is able to do. Yeah. That like, I mean, could, could AI five years from now create a bone or create a Kazu's amulet or create Raina's smile or create um, Kirkman's invincible or spy family or, you know, my way of the house husband or uh, you know, any manga we were talking about at the beginning of the show. I don't, I don't know that it could. I mean, I feel yeah. like it, 10 years, 15 years from now, it might be able to, I, but I, I don't know. There's still, I don't know why I'm growing less concerned that that's going to happen. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, uh, no, it totally makes sense because as somebody who's created stuff, here's the deal. If you've never created anything in your life, uh, you could easily be conned into thinking that uh, AI writing could achieve Jeff Smith's bone. All right. Because you don't, you have no idea what you're talking about, but if you've written a story, if you've actually written a story, if you've written something more complicated than uh, a, 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 a 12 page children's book in which character a wants the thing and then they get the thing. If you've ever written, you know that it's 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 a lot more complicated than just putting ideas together. There's a lot of stuff that happens, quite frankly, by mistake. There's a lot of things that happen yeah. out of sheer inspiration. And and I, I, I don't I, I, I may be a Luddite, but I don't believe that you can do that level of writing with with subtext and with context and with all these weird things that happen out of nowhere that fit right into place. Uh, I, 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 it's it's so complicated that I, I, I let me I just I, I guess the only way if okay time out if you ask any writer hey how did you write that story nine right. chances out of ten they can't answer you go to any comic convention where they have a panel discussion and somebody asks the at a, at a panel <clears throat> the most important question of all where do you get your ideas. Watch how people answer that. It's 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 the most crucial question to ask. It's existential for a creative person. Where do you get your ideas? And watch how quickly people try to avoid answering that question. Right? They always come up with a joke. Oh yeah, my ideas. I get them from a guy. He's got them on mail order from Dubuque. Uh, my ideas? Oh, they're in yeah. a closet in the base. You always get the 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 the. the horrible joke answer to where do you get your ideas you ever wonder why that is it's because we don't have the time don't know where do you yeah. get your ideas dave i don't fucking know sometimes they, sometimes i gotta go chasing them sometimes they drop out of, i don't know where i get my ideas now how are you going to program that it's 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 more it's it's such a high degree of complication that i really have a hard time believing that you're gonna you're, I, I think you're gonna be able to program uh, a, a, an ai to come up with a rough draft a, a, a story that's why i think that the double G, wgi uh writer strike is so important because yeah they could come up with something but then they're going to need an editor to make it make sense and then those editors are not going to get paid the same as writers they're not going to get residuals the way as writers they're going to be doing the same work but they're going to be called editors now uh that's that's where i think that i I, that that there's not going to be an ai at least not for quite a while yet that can do writing because we still don't know where this stuff comes from right so if you've been following the world of translation, and I think we might have talked about this before on a pro tips, translators are getting murdered by uh, AI because uh, it's so much cheaper and mm-hmm. you can get 80 to 90 percent of the way there. But what's happening and what I think what will happen with a lot of TV writing, what's happening in translation is someone will hire an AI to translate. It doesn't matter. Uh, Tolkien, right? They're going to translate right. Tolkien into Portuguese. And then what they'll do is they'll hire a Portuguese translator to look over what the AI did and make any corrections for a far, far smaller fee. And I think a lot of what TV writing, what Mm -hmm. writers are afraid of, rightly so, is the studios are just dumb enough 
to say, we're going to have AI generate 50 scripts, and then we're going to hire a junior, junior writer to look them over, see if any of them have a spark there, and then we'll hire another one at a junior, junior fee to, to spruce them up and add a few jokes or something, whatever, you know, whatever it is. Yep. Sweet. But the idea is that the, the workflow starts in an automated way and then becomes human. But honestly, the longer we do this, the more I feel like AI can be really good, perhaps, at saying, I want you to combine Aeschylus's The Frogs with a story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight with um, Dickens, uh, you know, uh, one of Carol. Dickens' stories, that kind of yeah. thing. Combine that, make a new story, but set it in New York in an apartment and there's 20 somethings, right? I think AI can do that kind of thing passably well. Mm -hmm. But until we get to AGI, which is artificial general intelligence, not just AI, where AI truly is feeling emotions, truly learning on their own, truly yeah. having stages of development where they are becoming a living creature, we're not going to get the nuance of writing and the nuance right. of new storytelling. They're not going to be able to create Raina's smile. They're not going to mm -hmm. be able to create Kazu's um, amulet until we get to AGI. And I feel like that's still decades away. And so I've, I've, and may, again, this is short term thinking, but I'm not worried for the next couple decades, next five to 15, 20 years that we're going to get to that. I think yeah. we'll still be able to tell independent stories in a way that only a human can tell. I think I can encapsulate this the best. This happened on my, on my discord uh, just yesterday. Somebody posted a link to a YouTube video in which somebody took Freddie Mercury's Bohemian Rhapsody and made it as if Frank Sinatra was singing it, right? And okay. they were like, oh my God, look at this thing. And if you listen to it, it, it's Frank Sinatra's voice singing Freddie Mercury's Bohemian Rhapsody, okay? Uh, but there's only one problem. As somebody who is a hardcore Sinatra fan, it's Sinatra's voice, but it's not Sinatra's singing. In other words, Freddie Mercury had a completely different style of singing. He had trills in his voice. He had a very up, upper register, right? Sinatra right. could hit the upper register, but uh, he didn't stay there. No, <laughs> right? Especially, Especially when he was like, older, he didn't stay yes, there. Yeah. Yes, as his voice matured and, and seasoned, uh, and, and he didn't do a lot of trills in his voice. And so it, it showed immediately, this one video showed it very quickly the, the strength of AI, it absolutely sounds like Sinatra's voice is singing Bohemia Rhapsody, but it's not Sinatra singing. Only one person could sing Sinatra as Bohemian Rhapsody or Bohemian Rhapsody as Sinatra, and he died several years ago. He's Frank Sinatra. Only one person can do Frank Sinatra singing Bohemia Rhapsody. Uh, the other one is, is a very close facsimile, but it's never going to have the same quality. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's that nuance that's going to save us. And and yeah. not just the nuance of how this is not Sinatra singing. It's the nuance of like um, the tiny emotions that frankly make no sense in a story that right. AI is going to get wrong, that a character would make <sighs> the wrong choice and consistently yeah. make the wrong choice or consistently um, have this weird reaction to a thing um you know if it's one of the brothers and brothers karamazov they would react to this consistently weird reaction that you're like huh mm -hmm. what an idiosyncratic human moment and no i don't know that ai for decades is going to be able to create those uniquely idiosyncratic human moments yeah. that make a story powerful that make a story right. impactful anyway all of this to say is Am I concerned about AI going into Kickstarter? Because remember, this was just an update that we were doing, and now it's a 10 minute discussion. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not concerned because A, if you remember, I'm an artist who is willing to work AI into my workflow, mm -hmm. where ultimately I am the creator of everything that you'll see on the page, but I probably, once it gets good enough in Photoshop, I will probably let AI experiment with layouts that I'll look over like 10, 15, 20 different layouts and go, oh, I like versions of this, I'll incorporate it in my work. Um, uh, so keeping in mind that I'm that type of artist that would be willing, like all the other Photoshop tools that I've incorporated into my flow, gradients, things that I couldn't do in in, mm -hmm. in pen and ink, you know, uh, my space scenes are so much easier to draw in Photoshop than they are in in uh, pen and ink because, frankly, I can copy paste stars that are it's right. just so much easier. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yes, I am willing to incorporate AI into my workflow and also. Um, I don't know that my stories are impacted by the existence of AI on Kickstarter. 
Uh, I'm. I, do I like them? No. Do, do I want them there? No. Do I wish they weren't on Kickstarter? Yes. Um, but I'll still use. I, I don't know. This is all coming to say. It's. It's for me. It's a very pragmatic approach in an imperfect world about yeah. AI ain't going anywhere. And also, I don't know that it's going to do what we're afraid it's going to do for a while yet. Yeah. No. And and listen, I I think that's a good place to leave that topic. AI ain't going anywhere. Uh, however, you and I are getting out of here because it's the end of the show. We got to wrap things up, Dave Kelly. Oh, my God. Is it the end of the show? Jeez Louise Bradley. <laughs> it is. It's, this is the part of the show where I say that you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my friend Brad Geiger, the creator of Evil Inc. at evilcomic.com. And uh, the, also, uh, I got to tell you, we haven't given it a shout out, but if you're looking for as a resource, online webcomics.com is where you want to go for brad's the incredible insightful hands-on pro tips and and looks at how to make a career in comics webcomics.com is where you want to go oh thank you so much that was very sweet of you and my good friend dave kellett the co-director of the comics documentary stripped and the cartoonist of sheldon at sheldoncomics.com and the wonderfully written beautifully drawn i got i oh, feel like i've got to you know kind of no, you don't have to do the payback it's, no it's, it's that makes it cheap when you no, do okay. the kind payback that makes it cheap don't do it don't right. you do, don't go well. to my websites everybody don't do it this is just brad being cheap <laughs> well you should you should but it's that if you decide you do it's that drive at drivecomic.com and the comic lab theme song is used with permission from andy creighton at theworldrecord.net and this episode and all episodes are edited by matt woodard of woodsong productions over at www.woodsong.media if you love comic lab you can rate and review the show on apple Podcasts, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode and comic lab is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab so i will go ahead and say that twice with emphasis patreon.com <laughs> slash comic lab So hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Myers used to be called Myers Thrifty Acres. What Myers the hell does that mean? Acres. I have no. Well, you you can be thrifty, and it's a store that goes on for acres and acres and acres. It was Myers Thrifty Acres. Do you ever get the sense that pre-war, when people were naming stores, they just had no <laughs> idea how to market a thing? Like they had traveled maybe two towns over was the farthest they had ever gone. Yeah. And Mister Meyer, when he's establishing his store, he's like. Well, well, I tell you what, we're going to have good prices, so let's have yeah. Thrifty in there thrifty. to let people know. And yeah. uh, I tell you what, we're going to have it on my two acres of land, so we're going to have Myers Thrifty Acres. <laughs> well, and maybe it started off as Myers Thrifty Backyard. You know, and then then as he grew, <laughs> as he grew, he's like, oh, my God, we've added an acre. We've got to change the name. It's 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 Myers Thrifty Acres. <laughs>